Okay, first, thank you so much for the invitation, John. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. I'm uh, Lori Mendez from San Diego, California with Save the Albatross Coalition. I am a lawyer. I don't do much environmental law, but um, John and I are trying, maybe still, but uh, to uh, sue plastic producers uh, eventually and maybe even small claims court. So if anyone wants to talk about that later, glad to. Um, so I was asked to talk about a whole lot of stuff in five minutes. I'm gonna do my best. So let me move it along. Uh, um, single use disposable plastics are bad. I know they're good, they have useful uh, purposes, but I would argue that they're very bad for the planet and humans in general and animal life. Um, you all probably know these facts. I, I don't wanna hammer them, hammer them over your head or into your head because you're probably extremely familiar with all of these, but the one that strikes me most and shows how unsustainable increasing uh, plastic production is, is that one um, uh, trash truck worth of plastic is dumped in the ocean, the equivalent, every minute of every day, all, all day long, 365 days of the year, year after year. And that is um, extremely unsustainable. So I went to Scripps for a year to get a master's and I learned that I have to go um, upstream to solve the problem. And that to do that, you know, we first have to look at Again, all of these um, solutions before we um, reducing, thinking of other ways, et cetera. Um, but basically being an anti-capitalist, I think is what it really comes down to or rethinking capitalism so that it is efficient um, and you know maybe charging the true costs. And there are a myriad of solutions and our legislature um, our state legislature and federal legislature are currently looking at those. Um, recycling is, you know, about halfway down, but it is definitely um, it is definitely a solution. This is just from zero waste Europe, and some people may dispute where on the hierarchy that should be. Um, I was talking about I am part of Save the Albatross Coalition. It's part of Zero Waste USA. Captain Charles Moore basically. Uh, one of the main founders, along with Neil Seldman. Um, and uh, we, I was called upon to write a letter to Nestle and Coca-Cola and PepsiCo early on in 2017, soon after we formed. And we really didn't get a response from them. We got, we'll get back to you at best, or nobody responded from Nestle. For example, Coca-Cola said they get back. We tried to follow up, nothing happened. Um, we were trying to connect the cap because our one of our goals is to keep caps, especially red Coca-Cola ones, from going out into the Pacific Ocean, into the northeastern garbage patch and being eaten by baby albatrosses, by parent albatrosses that regurgitate and feed their babies who can't regurgitate and die of, you know, stomach, um, stomach issues with, uh, with plastic in there. So... Anyway, when I said go way upstream, I meant all the way to oil extraction. And um, as you know, um, all of these stages of plastic production cause, um, sorry, cause GHD, um, greenhouse gas, and cause pollution every step of the way. Um, there's a big human cost, and that is that I have, I have said, uh, quoted, everything touches everything. And that is that there are intersectionalities with environmental costs, and that is the, the human cost, for example, all the way from Louisiana to Los Angeles. Um, in Cancer Alley in Louisiana and Los Angeles is one of the top producing, um, it's one of the top oil producers, I understand, in the world, surprisingly. Um, so uh, Steve Wilson and some others have done a good job, I think, showing this disproportionate um, uh, cost to fence line communities in, and also when we ship our plastics abroad in the story of plastics, maybe you've all heard of that. And also another documentary, Breathe This Air. So um, Captain Moore is fond of saying there is no way with plastics. And if you see either of these um, documentaries, you will understand better if you don't already understand um, why there's no way with plastics. It always goes somewhere and out of sight, out of mind doesn't mean that it's gone away. So some of the con conundrums, no way with plastics, the plastics are, are designed effectively 
because they're designed to be to last for um, tens or hundreds of years, and we only use them for, you know, a few seconds, moments, certainly less than six months, and then they're discarded. So again, along with that comes uh, disproportionate externalities, um, and um, we have to consider best available alternatives, but we must consider life cycle considerations. There are no silver bullets is what I learned when I went to Scripps Institution of Oceanography and interviewed uh, people that knew a lot more about the stuff than I do. So everything has a trade-off, but there must be transparency for recycling. The chasing arrow symbol, as we all know, is just misleading, downright misleading. And we need social and environmental justice. The people on the planet have to come first and they have to come now. So stack principles are in agreement. We agree with um, centering equity, re redesigning, banning wasteful products, making producers responsible for problem products, separating at the source, building zero waste infrastructure, and more. Um, so with recycling, even if we're 100% in favor of recycling first, or we definitely need recycling as part of the solution, especially in the shorter term, but only 9% of, of all the plastic in the world that's you know, been made has been recycled. That's, um, unless anybody has a better statistic, that's, it's, we can do better. So again, I talked about transparency. We really need to work on greenwashing and people need to have a good understanding. There is a Minnesota study of seven out of 10 people um, thought that all chasing arrows meant that, that uh, the product was recyclable. And I believe that's by design. It was initially uh, we just would say it's confusing, it's complicated, it's frustrating, we don't know what's recyclable, but really it is misleading, fraudulent, and deceptive. Um, and there's already been one lawsuit filed against, um, against plastic producers, and they do allege exactly that. Another issue is PFAS, so um, those are definitely, we know now, dangerous to the health and environment, and uh, we have to have a trust in, you know, in plastic producers and, 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 and that we can actually recycle them and they're not gonna kill us or our planet. So right now already currently in the California legislature are a whole lot of bills um, regarding plastics. And here are some of them, I'm happy to make, make these available to everybody, all my slides, so you don't have to copy them all down. Um, so uh, one is the Basel Convention Resolution and that is just that we resolve to follow the Basel Convention of 2019. Um, I know you all are talking about the bottle bill and you know, there's um, their packaging, sorry, they're, I'm so sorry. There's packaging, a packaging bill um, and apparently um, Amazon is not opposed to it, um, but there are others that are. And microfibers um, to, um, to have washing machines built so that they, the microfibers can't get into the, the ocean. Um, but it's not going to apply to dryers. I could go on, but we can get into these more if you want in the question and the answers. So I'll tell you what I do know about them. And then again, the PFAS is a concern. So there's legislation regarding removing those in food packaging and cookware, at least letting people know about that. And returnable bottles, I think you'll all be talking about that. Um, so there are many um, different bills right now that are being considered and making their way through um, one house or the other, and some are falling by the wayside. And um, there's also the Plastic Free California Ballot Initiative. So um, one of the things that, that is suggested is if, if it can't get through the legislature, if there's opposition by money lobbyists, then the people need to take over and they have, I believe that it has, it has enough signatures, it's going to be on the 2022 ballot. And then there was an emergency executive order for foodware accessories that the um, governor signed during COVID, but that has been allowed to expire. And the current law says that, um, I think it's AB 619, that says that you can bring your glasses, your cups, your food, your food containers into a restaurant um, or a uh, drink place like Starbucks, and they're supposed to let you do it, but I can tell you from experience yesterday, Starbucks would not let me use my own. They wouldn't even let me buy my own, clean it themselves, and then put something in it. So anyway, that's kind of, we're gonna be dealing with that soon. 
Um, break three on the federal front, and this is the last thing I'll tell you about, is that um, that uh, entered, um, that was uh, sponsored by Senator Udall Lowenthal, and that uh, was brought um, to the, I think the Senate, um, in March, late March of 2019. And these are all the things it would do. It's really expansive and it would be a great bill if everything that, you know, started out stayed in it, but we'll see what happens. We're waiting for the, it's in the process of the, it's in the sausage making process right now. There's also the Recycle Act that um, is a bi, um, bicameral act. It was introduced in both houses and you might know about this more than I do, but I guess there's some um, funds for uh, recycling infrastructure. And, and I could go on and on <laughs> about so many things. I look forward to your question. And I just want to let you know, the lace, this lace on Albatross thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> and so do I. Thank, Thank you, Lori. That, okay. That's an awful lot of stuff. I I'm, know. Sorry, I'm sorry there's no silver bullet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to you with questions. I, I, I think in the agenda, we said we would save questions for the end. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda, who's gonna tell us how to save the world with compost. Yeah, okay. So I, th hi, everybody. Um, uh, nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. I'm with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Neil, nice to see you. We don't get to see each other that often, so. Good to see you, Brenda. Who knew? We'd connect. <laughs> And who good to see Laurie too. Hi, Laurie. Um, so John asked me to talk about really the connection to soil. And I, I didn't really prepare a lot of slides because I had five minutes and that was too, too dangerous to put a slide back together. Um, but what I wanted to share is kind of starting with the state of the world's soils. Well, one third of the world's arable land has been lost to soil erosion and continues to be lost at an alarming rate. In the US, the statistics are also, it's not just globally or in the emerging south, emerging south or elsewhere, 99 million acres of US cropland, that's 28% of all US cropland, so almost a third, is eroding above soil tolerance levels which means that the long-term productivity of the soil can't be maintained and new soil is not adequately replacing lost soil. And it's really, a lot of it has to do with soil erosion and the ability of soil to store water and su support plant growth. And we can only imagine, you know, how climate disruption, climate destruction is accelerating this, right, in the U.S., and particularly where most of you all are. Um, I think, um, you know, the good news is that adequate organic matter is one key to building healthy soil, as well as, you know, air and water quality, there's connections, and compost is a proven way to build organic matter in soil. And, and you might ask, well, why is organic matter so important? Well, organic matter, when you add that to soil in the form of like compost, it, it, it's the humus and compost is, is a, like a soil aggregator. It holds soil, soil particles together, kind of like glue really. And so it, it enhances the ability to, of water to hold not only uh, enhances the ability of soil to hold not only water, but also nutrient holding capacity. It's something called cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of soil to hold nutrients and it improves soil structure. So it can reduce the severity and cost of extreme weather events, whether those weather events are droughts or floods or disease. So we really need to build um, the humus up in soil. And then when it comes to Climate protection, you know, you're not only taking out of landfills and reducing methane, yada, 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 but you're creating, you're enhancing soil's ability to act as a carbon sink. So composting is kind of win-win. I think uh, maybe many of you, all of you, I don't know, are familiar with the Marin Carbon Farming Project. Yes, I see some nods. So, you know, they did a study and they repeated it, but they initially did the study with a half inch of compost on grass, grass rangeland and um, it increased the water holding capacity in soils tremendously and sequestered carbon. I think if just half the rangeland in California um, had a half inch of compost applied, it would offset 42 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which was equivalent 
to the annual greenhouse gas emissions from energy use for the commercial and residential sectors in California. So really huge. And then they repeated that study with a quarter inch of compost and it was the same thing. So, and I, I ran some numbers looking at if we would apply half an inch of compost to that 99 million acres that's severely eroding, that would require 3 billion tons of compost. We don't have enough compost to meet that need. There's, we're not even close. And then when it comes to just the water benefits of soil, I mean, like some of the, the biggest markets for compost now is not just ag land, but soil, preventing soil erosion and stormwater management. And so it's like green infrastructure, like bioswales, green roofs, rain gardens. And rain gardens, they need organic matter. They allow 30% more water to soak into the ground. So, you know, in, when we're facing these severe droughts, um, we really need minimum organic matter standards. We need more organic matter in our soils. There's um, some cities that are, are establishing that and they range from like communities in, in uh, Washington state, which has a lot of rain. So to prevent stormwater management to places in Texas and Colorado, like Greeley in Colorado, the water and sewer department, the, the uh, city has minimum organic matter standards if you're disturbing soil. And their studies show that adding compost properly to soil can produce as much as 30% water saving. So it's, the benefits are really tremendous and for stormwater. So I wanted to just, I think, do any of you know who, who had this quote? The nation that destroys its soils destroys itself? Anybody? Karl, Mar Karl Marx. And Neil didn't even know what we were talking about, guys. Before you joined, I mentioned that you were a Colin Mox expert. But Neil, you are wrong. That is not what you said. <laughs> Anybody else? The nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. That was we're empty. Good. Sorry, who's, who's going to guess? All, we're all Googling it. Yeah, no. Oh, no, no. You can't Google it. No, no. It's FDR. And he... He wrote that in a letter that he sent to all the state governors in February 1937. And two years earlier, the federal government had passed the law creating the Soil Conservation Service, which today is the Natural Resources Con Conservation Service. But that conservation, Soil Conservation Service was set up to combat soil erosion caused by the droughts of the Dust Bowl, right? And so that was his quote. There was another quote from somebody else and I want to see if you could even guess who said this. So Neil, pay attention. <laughs> okay, ready? Love of liberty means the guarding of every resource that makes freedom possible from the sanctity of our families and the wealth of the soil to the genius of our scientist. Is that not a quote for today? It is. Oh. I would guess Ben Franklin. Okay, anybody else? I think you'll be surprised by this. Love of liberty means the guarding of every resource that makes freedom possible from the sanctity of our families and the wealth of the soil to the genius of our scientists. That is in the first inaugural address of Eisenhower from 1953, wow. which I was surprised about. Okay, here's another one. Um, to burn organic waste, is to condemn our nation's soils to a continued loss of organic matter and increased soil erosion and a loss of the vitality and life-sustaining force of those soils. Very commoner. Oh, you're so close. So close. These are all good people. We should, we should talk about them too, right? This <laughs> is actually Nora Goldstein's dad, Jerry Goldstein. Oh my gosh. So in wonderful. 1975, he's the founder of BioCycle. And he suggested back in 1975 that we have a national humus program <laughs> and that it was vital. And so that was, and then that got, you know, 1976 got kind of transformed to, to a, a call for a national soil for fertility program. And that was one of his quotes from, from that era. And in the report I co-authored with his daughter, the state of composting the US, which 2014, uh, we called for a National Soils Act, similar in scope, by the way, to the Federal Clean Act and the Clean Water Act. And what to kind of bring it back today, what we're working on, I'm, I'm working with the US Composting Council, California's Against Waste signed on, by the way, as part of the coalition of a national coalition called the US 
um, composting infrastructure coalition and um, in, we're in bed with some interesting bedfellows but we're very focused on um, getting money to build more composting infrastructure and I think one of the roles that the Institute for Local Self-Reliance is playing you know as they say if you're not at the table you're on the menu right so we're really arguing for funding for a distributed infrastructure system, you know, farmers, small scale home composting programs, and not allowing uh, funding that would get established just to privilege large scale industrial sites. So if I had more time, we could go into all the benefits to communities of jobs and environmental justice and racial equity of building our infrastructure small scale. But what I can share is that, and I'll put it in the chat, um, Monica, maybe, well, I don't want to take away attention from you speaking, but I'll put it in when I'm done speaking, is Senator Booker from New Jersey introduced a 1072 bill, and it provides incentives for ag producers to carry out climate stewardship practices. To, and it's, that bill would um, create a soil health equipment grant program. It would also um, encourage reforestation across the US. And the $100 million in grants over 10 per year over 10 year period. So that's, a, if I can do math, a billion dollars, right? Um, there's only two priorities listed. And one is on farm composting projects. And so, and um, there's another bill that we're working with, um, with some uh, Congress people that hopefully will be introduced next week by the end of the month that's going to require the designation of composting as a conservation practice and activity. So we're coming for full circle here to protecting um, the, the uh, you know, US soil, but the battle will continue. And there's just one other thing I'll mention. I'm sorry, I'm probably over my five minutes, but um, most of you are probably familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was also tied to FDR. And um, I think it was often called FDR's tree army. And Biden has introduced, um, I don't know if he's a bill yet, but the, uh, the Climate Conservation Corps. And I don't think composting is part of that, but I would love to see a campaign or work to make that part of it. But I just want to share some of the amazing statistics on um, what FDR's New Deal program, the um, Civilian Conservation Corps did. It was designed to bring relief to unemployed youth during the depression and it was authorized in 1933 and it enrolled almost 3 million men, 18 to 25 years old as a peacetime army to do battle against the destruction and erosion of natural resources. The labor department recruited volunteers, the army trained them and the Ag and Interior Department supervised their work. In less than 10 years, the Corps planted a billion trees for soil conservation, built fire breaks, fought fires, cleaned streams and beaches, built countless federal and state parks, campsites, fire towers, trails, blah, 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 roads, bridges. But the social consequences were extraordinary. Uh, Mount malnourished despairing young men were able to regain confidence and health to enter remedial ed education programs so thousands of illiterates were taught to read and write and rebuild our country and the program what i thought was really notable is it expanded to include native americans before the corps ended in 1943 over 80,000 native americans had passed through its ranks so and also enlisted older skilled workers too by the way but what's interesting i also think is that every state by delaware could boast permanent projects accomplished by Roosevelt's tree army. And it's just ironic that Biden is from Delaware and now kind of coming up with the civilian climate corps. So I'll just um, leave you with that. And um, next week when um, this bill gets introduced or by, by the end of Ju uh, June, I will circle back about what NECRA maybe could get involved in. Thank, thank you, Brenda. I, I, I sent you a, a chat asking you to circulate the, the name and the contact information for this national, this group of nationalists promoting soil policy to try to get enough compost made to do the job. Because since we're quoting things, I'll quote uh, Einstein, a quote I read today, which said, in the middle of every difficulty, there is opportunity. So there's a lot of difficulties uh, it sounds like compost is an opportunity. I'd like to get NICRA more involved in compost and compost policy. So please circulate that. And thank you for sharing all those things. You're welcome. I'm going to put the chat in the in the chat the, the link to uh, 
Cory Booker's bill, which is public. And then the one that we're working on is called the Compost Act, um, which hopefully I'll be able to share more uh, later. Thank and you. Then I'll, I'll put in also the uh, coalition we're working with. I think you had just asked for that. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. So shifting from, from water and earth to air, uh, we still burn garbage. And sometimes we burn garbage and call it different things. And Monica Wilson of Gaia has been upset about that for a long time and doing stuff about that. So I've asked her to speak tonight about why we're doing this stuff. What can we do about it? And why is, it a, why is that important? Okay, thanks, John. And it's not just me. <laughs> I feel like so many people on this call right now could give this presentation. So just start there. Um, right. So Gaia, for those of you who don't know Gaia, uh, we're an alliance that supports movement building and local campaigns against incineration, for zero waste, um, against plastic, for climate action. Um, and we do a lot of work around the uh, nexus of policy and finance. Um, we do a lot of collaborative research and, and support sort of common organizing pushes. <laughs> um, and I am in Berkeley and I used to serve on the NICRA board. So I kind of feel like it's a little reunion. And also Brenda is one of my favorite people. So like presenting with her is just like, yay. I'm just really happy to be here and, and be with you all tonight. So I've got a few, um, a few slides. Sorry, <laughs> Brenda, that was really impressive. Um, so, so here we go. Let's see if this is working. Thumbs up. We have four Zoom calls happening right now simultaneously in my house. So I'll go a little <laughs> slow in case my, my things are slow, but if it's working, okay, great. So, um, so I'll talk a bit about like, you know, what is incineration about from the problem side? And then um, uh, a few, ideas for what we could be watching for as NICRA. So as the, the cover of the April National Geographic uh, 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 issue showed, incineration is about the fight for clean air. This They had a really great um, overview of the campaign in Baltimore by the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Brenda and Neil have done a lot of work with this group and with, with complex groups affiliated with them. So you've got, you can ask a whole set of folks questions about it tonight. Um, but in some, I think it's, this is a great article to read to get a really big picture of like, um, what is the fight for clean air these days in, in many different contexts all around the world. Um, and it was really powerful to include this example of a community campaign to close an incinerator through zero waste and through building compost infrastructure and building zero waste um, in that whole article. So I really encourage you to find this, this issue online or ask me to secretly share you uh, the text. Um, incinerations about environmental racism. So almost 80% of US incinerators are built in, were built in communities of color, in low-income communities. And talking about California history, um, it was you know, a California report to the California Integrated Waste Management Board by the, by the Sorrell Associates that really has, you know, became a, um, uh, just shone a, a great light on how communities were being targeted and exploited because of race, because of class um, in the 1980s for, for building incinerators, for building hazardous waste facilities. Um, and so it's also true for most hazardous waste sites. John asked about hazardous waste. Most hazardous waste sites are built in communities of color across the US. So um, confronting environmental racism means closing these incinerators down. Um, Incinerations about climate change in a huge way. We, um, we have a new science and policy director, which makes me really excited. And he just uh, wrote and submitted for publication in an academic publication, um, an assessment of, of greenhouse gas emissions from different energy sources and showing that incineration is dirtier than the rest of the grid. So I can send these links afterwards. You don't need to note all this down right now, but that there's just, overwhelming evidence that incineration is bad and terrible for the climate and, and compost and zero waste are obviously 40 billion times better. So it's insane to just keep burning this stuff. Um, and you know the, the way this shows up in California is that incineration is technically not included in the, um, in the renewable portfolio standard, which incentivizes renewable energy, unless, your incinerator in Stanislaus County, yeah. which is one of the two remaining incinerators in the state. So half the incinerators 
are allowed to get renewable energy credits. So there's this loophole that we really need to close in California. So in terms of what's needed in California, that would be enormous, right? Not to mention the 10% diversion credit, which incinerators still receive, which is also insane and needs to be closed. Um, and then at the federal level, the, the Clean Futures Act has a lot of great stuff in it and still includes uh, a few incentives for incineration, which just need to get pulled out, drawn out. So supporting that is another thing that, that NICRA can be doing. I'd be happy to talk more about that. And there's a whole huge slew of folks working on that. Um, I want to touch on, John asked about new tech. So I just want to touch on chemical recycling because there's so much buzz around it. Um, we've done a lot of research into this over the past year and a half, both in um, Europe, where there's a lot more facilities, and in the US. So this is the cover of our US report, which we decided was all talk and no recycling. Like there's basically no functioning chemical recycling in the United States, at least as of last summer. Um, most of these sites that are being touted as chemical recycling are plastic to fuel. So if you're just gonna take the plastic, turn it into fuel and burn it, like what the heck is the difference? What's the point of that? That's, that's ridiculous. It certainly should not be considered recycling in any way and, and should not be supported. Um, but we also found that technologically, it's not really viable to do this. And uh, economically, it doesn't pencil out and there would be huge carbon and toxic footprints. So like, no. And yet US plastic makers and consumer giants are pouring tons of money, tons of money into chemical recycling. So that's another thing that we really need to keep our laser focus on and, and be really watchful for in state and federal policy. And at the local level, this is, these are not the directions we wanna to go to solve, solve plastic. Um, it's like reduction is really the only solution, which of course is the last thing the industry wants, but we all know that it's the only solution, right? Um, so let me touch on a few other regions of the world because I just, it's impossible for me not to do that. So uh, in the EU, we, there's a new blog on Gaia Europe, which is called Zero Waste Europe. The website's down there. I can send it out at the end, but they have a new blog right on the front page. that talks about all the ways that incineration is getting pulled out of EU policy from renewable energy standards to uh, recovery plans, to just transition fund, to development aid. So um, there's just so many ways that incineration is getting pulled out of policy in Europe. And that's really important. The other thing I wanted to mention, because John asked for this too, is, is incineration and EPR. And we can see in so many cases in European EPR policy that EPR is simply entrenched existing disposal facilities. So if you're just taking all the stuff and it still ends up at the incinerator, then how is that actually helping or making any difference, right? So lessons around EPR and incineration and lessons on um, need, the need for safeguards, for community control, for city control, for benchmarks, and for examining whether reduction is actually happening or whether it's just the same old, same old flowing through different control. Like, like all of those things really need to be questioned and, and looked at really carefully. And we just need a, we need a high standard in, in waste policy overall, right? No matter what the policy is. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is waste trade. Um, we've been doing a lot of, you know, because Guy's a global network, we have a lot of uh, members who are tracking and, and spotlighting uh, waste trade scandals. So those are showing up um, in Tunisia, um, in Malaysia, um, in Turkey, um, and in many places across Africa, this is a growing awareness. So uh, the whole push around Basel Convention has been something that many members are doing in their countries. And it's really exciting that California has a bill to do the same thing, to replace the completely awful lack of action on the, at the US government level. But we, we really have to um, be so careful about what we're exporting and mixed plastic waste exports are just not acceptable. Like that's the line that we've drawn. So uh, this is a, a growing push from many, many uh, um, activists in many countries and the Stop Waste Colonialism campaign is a recent example on Africa Day, which was May 25th, I think. Um, our members across Africa came together and put out a video about Stop Waste Colonialism, about not wanting exports of 
mixed plastic to come in to any country in Africa from Europe, from the US, and also not wanting um, incineration and other chemical recycling, other exports of technology to end up in Africa. So wrapping all that together, that's a really great video um, that I hope you can check out on our website. Um, yeah, so that's, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end there. I know I went over, but federal, you know, we, we, need to, we need to hold strong standards at the federal and state level around energy policy, around um, waste policy, avoiding exports, and really all of this stuff requires, like, like the big change requires building resilient zero waste systems that work, right? So while we're stopping all the bad, we have to be building the good, um, or it just doesn't work, or we just transfer the bad in another situation. We never end the fight. So, um, so that's my request to Nicra. Solve it all. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the stop waste. I love the stop waste colonialism. Neil, I think, coined the term many years ago, um, garbage imperialism, which is basically the same. You know, totally. totally. Yeah, garbage imperialism, stop waste colonialism. Absolutely. I was just talking to one of our colleagues, which we, we have a new big anti monopoly, anti corporate concentration focus. And, uh, um, my, one of my colleagues just penned an article. We're actually going to think of calling it, you know, something with garbage imperialism in the title. So it's so nice to see that there's other campaigns on the same thing. So, well, th thank, thank you, everybody, for doing so, doing your absolute best to try to answer all the complicated questions that I sent you in five minutes. So that, that wasn't an easy task. I appreciate the effort. I have some questions, but I want to turn it over to the group first to ask. I have, I have a question, but I have an observation. I just got back from uh, Oregon. We drove up and back on I-5, Interstate 5. I counted, I think, at least 20 compost facilities uh, on both sides of the road going up. And I'll bet a lot of them are just under the radar completely. They look like the things that are happening just because entrepreneurs get an idea they had, you know, basically what you're looking for is piles of dark material, a lot of times screened, sometimes not screened, uh, other material that's feedstock like pallets and so on and piles, uh, and then loaders and uh, all kinds of loaders and sometimes shredders, but at least 20. And I, that's really new for me. I've been going up and back to Oregon for 30 or 40 years now, and I've never seen anything like what I saw this time. Just a very interesting observation. Uh, Freddie yeah. has his hand up. Freddie, would you like to go? Oh, sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my comment, my question is for Monica because I have been following the chemical recycling mostly because my program manager is making me do it. Um, and I feel like um, it has been sweeping the red state. It's pretty interesting how many Republican states for the most part have been adopting or expanding chemical recycling interstate legislatures, it seemed like. So I'm curious, like, how is that happening? Um, you know, why uh, is it because they're asking the states to consider these technologies as recycling infrastructure or um, they need budget for it. I'm just curious if you know anything about that, but I know that it's really expanding to big cities as well, like Phoenix, Indianapolis. Cool, hey, Freddie, it's good to see you. Um, I, I think part of what we've observed when we did that research last summer um, on this report, and here I'll, I just wanted to add the link here, is that, um, a lot of this infrastructure seems to be co-located or connected to fossil fuel industry facilities, mm -hmm. fossil fuel, op fuel operations. Not all of it, right? Yeah. Some of them aren't, but um, in terms of places where, where uh, the American Chemistry Council, which is the group pushing for these policies at the state level, and where the fossil fuel industry are, are working together to call for, um, to make it easier to build them, this seems to be, um, the sweet spot for them, for that industry. They're, they're trying to just put it at, at fossil fuel operations. Um, 
it's not in every case, like the Phoenix example you, you gave, I think that is, um, if I remember right, that, why am I blanking on the name right now? The group that was in Salt Lake. Anyway, they, they closed them on operations and now they've moved to Phoenix. Um, they were affiliated with Dow and American Chemistry Council around the, the and this hefty energy bag baloney out of Boise, Idaho for the past few years. And now that's ended. Um, so I, I also think it's where you have <coughs> people who are, you know, cities who might be desperate to do what they think is the right thing um, in the case of Phoenix, or maybe there is some sort of fossil fuel industry um, push there too. I really don't know. I, I think so, you know, there's, there's a bit of the entrepreneurial yeah. folks out to make a quick buck side, as well as the giant Exxon mobile side. So it's, we're getting it from all ends. I don't, I don't know if that helped at all, but <laughs> that was just sort of the, the categories we were saying. Uh, Neil, did you want to add something? Yes. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank this three uh, women for their incredible presentations. In fact, uh, and I'm so pleased it's record, being recorded because as we may know, you, you may know, uh, the industry came out with a waste to energy report last week, which of course says we need waste energy to save the climate. So uh, now uh, no one has to write a review. We just have to refer to this recording because the three presentations <laughs> uh, really knocked, this, knocked, knocked that uh, off the pedestal. Um, but I also wanted to mention, uh, Freddie, thanks for the question, um, but it's not just the uh, red states because Hawaii is, is uh, being hit by these uh, promoters as, as uh, Monica said. And um, I'm more, I'm not as generous as Monica. I don't think it's good people um, making a bad decision. I think this is orchestrated uh, by people who just have no respect or no, no uh, sense of responsibility for the environment because it's very well coordinated. In fact, um, <clears throat> I would add that it's states, uh, they're going after state bonding uh, 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 resources in South Carolina. I heard a presentation uh, that the state can't bond anything else because there are so many uh, 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 bond supports, uh, backups for uh, these uh, gasification plans. Uh, so it, it and uh, uh, Monica did well to mention Dow, uh, their, uh, their uh, uh, environmentally sound gasification <laughs> for plastic uh, program. Uh, which is uh, also being uh, lobbied all across the country. So it's a major, it's a major um, uh, effort. We've uh, more or less defeated the large mass burn plants, but now we have these other, other uh, components coming at us. So again, thanks for these presentations, which are a terrific antidote to the industry propaganda. So I, I just want to add a little, because I've done some reading on this. There are a lot of uh, polluting industries that locate in red states. And I don't know it's because they're red states, but they're, they're, they're very organized, as Neil said, and it's, it's all about you know, the, the, uh, the fiction that they're creating jobs and economy, but they're actually polluting everything in sight as, as well. We're in California. What do we do with, when, when they're building chemical, you know, uh, burning places in, in Louisiana. What, what can we do out here? We, we have a nice little Covada plant in Stanislaus County, which I guess gets renewable energy credit. And there's probably a connection between Covada and the EPR people. But yeah. what can California do about Louisiana? Because you know, their bad ear comes to us sooner or later. Well, I, I, I sorry, Tab, I, I think what's happening is that like Monica said, a lot of these technologies are coming to cities that might not have a recycling infrastructure as a solution to the plastic problem. So should we be aware, you know, alerted, like say Bakersfield or some city that is in that doesn't really have the same markets as other Bay Area cities, should should that be something that we be working against, you know, to make sure that chemical recycling um, is not recycling in California before it comes to the state. <laughs> um, if I could just make mention that, for example, in Louisiana, 
We can certainly sign petitions and we can certainly make phone calls, although we're not constituents. I know we're not going to be heard in the same way, but we can use our voices and speak up and we can uh, be good allies and we can support however we're asked to support. I think we can even send money to those organizations, right, to help them lobby and um, advocate for themselves. And also in Los Angeles, I had the experience in Sacramento that many legislators in the east in the eastern part of the state or away from the ocean they did not care anything about um plastic pollution especially ocean problems because it was very far from what you know their concerns and priorities and so we must get on board um recognizing the intersectionalities um at least those of us like myself who come from uh coastal parts of the state and recognize that there's much more to be discussed and much more work to do um, in the inland uh, parts of the state and country, uh, but starting in California with inland parts of our state and that there is overlap. There are intersectionalities between the environmental movement and, uh, and all of our concerns and um, what's going on socially and health wise with the people in um, that are constituents of uh, dis different districts who don't have oceans in their backyard. So anyway, I just I just want to mention that I have to sign off. But thank you so much. Any other questions for Laura before she signs off? The the, the, the question I always get asked, Lori, is, well, what if we what if we make a plastic out of something besides petrochemicals? Won't that solve the problem? Well, I know CAW was mentioned and also Captain Moore. He actually is, uh, Captain Moore is looking for best alternatives. And I know that they're in the legislature, they're discussing making an ASTM standard for um, biodegradability and you know how fast it biodegrades and different standards that are uniform so that um, companies can be held accountable. And I think that's a lot of what we're talking about here is accountability. But um, Captain Moore of our organization is on board for some tested and, you know, um, I guess some reliably tested products. He's not adverse to those. But um, so, so that is not to be excluded as a possibility. I'm also trying to work on uh, diminishing the amount of cigarette butts that are in California and everywhere, but starting in, in San Diego. And um, there are some companies that make biodegradable cigarette butts. They're totally biodegradable. But the question is, the question for me is, in that case, what's left over? Because then you've got, you know, I don't know if it's several, it might be dozens of chemicals in, in what was the cigarette butt, including nicotine and tar and all of that. But, um, but anyway, and that goes then directly in a concentrated form into the water. So studies still need to be done. Uh, that's where the science come in, comes in. So not opposed to that, good idea if it can be done. Again, there is, in my opinion, there's no silver, silver bullet, but you know, if it can be done, then I think that would be great. Just again, make sure you're not using something made of corn, like in the poop bags um, that, I mean, maybe it's better, but all right, if you use something that can be composted, let's say, I think that would be fantastic. If it biodegrades and doesn't end up, you know, as a, a if it's a biodegradable bottle cap and it doesn't end up choking an albatross for that. But I'm saying make sure that it doesn't cause more harm. For example, again, if you're using GMO corn and then you've got the runoff of the, the chemicals, um, the nitrogens and all of that in the soil that are going into the Gulf of, um, of um, uh, right below Texas, the Gulf of Mexico, and um, you know, and going into the Mississippi, et cetera, and and it, there's whole there's a whole host of other problems that are caused. So all I'm saying is we think it through, through, we can try it, and again, we have to be adaptable. If it doesn't work, then you know we have to pivot, and that's all I can say. There are some things we're just going to have to try. Yeah, I mean, I can. Add to that, John, I've done a lot of work on um, bioplastics. I used to help be on the, um, um, found the Sustainable Biomaterials Materials Collaborative. And I think, I think when it comes to plastic, single use has got to go, no matter what it's made out of. 
You know, I used to think that the compostable food service wear was like an interim strategy, but with where we are in the climate, I don't think we have time for interim strategies anymore. We just got to, we got to ban single use and we got to, before we can get to the bans, we need to elevate and shine a spotlight on those restaurants and those that are doing durables. We have a Indian restaurant not too far from where our DC office was that was using those metal tiffin cans for takeout, you know, the stack cans. And um, you would join and you would get one and then you'd bring it back and they would build up their customers, returning customers. And that's like standard practice in India. There's whole jobs of guys and people on bicycles delivering, you know, food in tiffin containers. So there's no technical obstacles to doing something else. It's just the policy and the incentives. So I think single use has got to go. I mean, I do think there are issues with corn being a monoculture crop and it, there's a case to be made also that we shouldn't be making bioplastics from food crops anyway. So, um, but a lot of the companies that make some of those bioplastics, they're agnostic when it comes to feedstocks. They can be made with grasses and other things, you know, and um, I think from a carbon climate footprint, you know, being made from biomass is a little bit better than fossil fuel based stuff. But I think it's the single use and the durability. If we look at what we're throwing away, it's, it's all packaging and stuff that could be easily eliminated. We've got zero waste grocery stores. We can have zero waste restaurants. We just need to make different rules and fight like hell for the world we want to live in. And I think when it comes to helping those Louisiana plants, you know, it's, it's, we got to stop buying all that plastic. So I don't know. I mean, I don't have all the answers, but I just, it's just crazy. You know, we've got soil erosion and, and microplastics in soil and incinerators and we've taken land away from african-american land you know farmers and there's like deep connections here on the racial equity and the things monica you were bringing up and air pollution and we have the solutions but we're not make we're not able to you know fight the corporate dollars or whatever they're having impact at you know this this the the um you know, states, Freddie, that you mentioned, it's probably vested interests that are impacting those laws, right? And so that's what we got to fight is vested corporate interest all the time. Well, as, as the Washington person on the call, is Washington paying attention to what you're saying? Well, I wish. Where's my <laughs> magic wand? <laughs> I do have a congressional briefing tomorrow morning on composting. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. John, my my response to you is, which Washington are you talking about, the Democrats or the Republicans? Uh, there, are, there are two separate Washingtons, unfortunately. Well, I, I was meeting the one that's that says they're in power right now. Well, uh, not to, it's not, it, they don't have all the power we wish them to have. Uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> I can't say how, uh, how deeply worried I am about what's going on. As Brendan, Monica, and, and Lori pointed out, it's all interconnected. It's all with getting uh, power into the right people's hands at the local level, organized citizens, et cetera. We know what to do. It's no secret. Uh, the, it, it's, it's not a conspiracy. What's going on in the world is, you know, we're, we're doing the exact wrong things. Um, and what's going on with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the voting, <clears throat> it's all integrated. Uh, Louisiana, the whole the whole state is a soup of chemical junk, uh, including the you know ten miles out from the coast of Louisiana. It's uh, it's incredible what corporate America has done, and we've got to somehow uh, uh, get together the strength to get through the system that praise it, that rewards minority control, and we've got to get majority control. Uh, the most of the people in the United States want to do the right thing but it's a minority uh, structure that's killing us, literally killing us. Talking about the filibuster. I'm talking about the whole way the system is set up, that Wyoming with population of 500,000 has the same vote in the Senate as California with what, 40 million people and DC doesn't get a vote. If DC had the vote, we the Democrats would have the power uh, that we want them to have in Congress now, but. So uh, it, it, and uh, I would uh, again praise Monica for bringing all of these issues together, including the international issues. Uh, what we do here impacts everyone else. 
But you know, so Kelly, but you know, and Neil, I completely agree with you about being worried about what's going on nationally. But one of the reasons I think we we at our organization have worked mostly we're working a lot more on the federal level with anti-monopoly and antitrust issues now, but um, but we've mostly worked at the local level and the state level because if you get enough cities to do stuff like Dan, what you did in Berkeley, you know, in the 80s, I guess, you know, it percolates up to the state level. And California, you know, can really do a lot. So, and it has, I mean, the, all that list of bills that Lori listed i mean and there's equal equal bills probably on the kind of composting side that have been moving money and infrastructure i mean it's not all great but at least we got rid of california allowing compost to be landfill cover right so that's helping to elevate the quality of compost in the state and driving to better markets so not to otherwise i'm going to get too depressed neil so <laughs> we have to talk about the positive stuff we can do okay i i will and and positive stuff is is going on there's there's no question as a matter of fact I, i'm having one of my assistants in, interview dan on this subject in a couple of weeks but um <clears throat> another thing is is going on and it's it's uh, you know governments sometimes fail but there's piling on against government uh cal recycle which de uh, deserves a lot of criticism is being torn apart and they're going to come up with an industry bottle bill that they control everything. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, the other thing is this e the EPR people for producer control uh, and, and it's even gotten into the recycling partnership uh, which is neutral on EPR. If you read their most latest report which I'll get everyone a draft review of in a week or so, <clears throat> they're bashing government uh, just like the Republicans, uh, and starting out with Reagan in the last 50 years or so, they're saying that government is incompetent, when in fact government is solving the problems. Our people on other uh, aspects of our work have pointed out <clears throat> that it was local government that, had, that helped uh, businesses more than the federal government get through COVID, with new zoning laws, new, uh, all kinds of new laws at the local level. And uh, as I said before, if the people, if the majority of people were in control, we, we'd be in good shape. Uh, but government uh, bashing at the uh, local and federal level is a major part of the right wing ideology. Uh, so uh, it's, it, we have to, uh, <clears throat> well, we have to do a lot of things, but certainly we have to defend local government as literally uh, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the door between the wolf and, and our families. Uh, so um, there's a lot, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting uh, capitalism, which is a tough thing to do. Uh, but we're, we're united, we know what to do. So let's keep on pushing. Well, let me get, try let's, to, let's, let's work let me, harder. Let me try to tell an inspiring story then since you brought up COVID. I just read a book, the book by Michael Lewis. It's a new book called The Premonition. And it tells the story about how a small group of very smart people figured out what was going on with COVID before the CDC did, before the federal government did, and they stepped in when the federal government didn't lead. And it's a, it's a brilliantly told nonfiction book that's driven by some very compelling characters. And in the end, what, what these, the small group of people realized is that we can't get the CDC to do anything, we can't get the federal government to do anything, but, we can get California to do something. And so their entire strategy to get somebody to do something smart was centered around getting the ear of Gavin Newsom in, in a moment of crisis. And you can criticize what he did or not did, but the, the signs that these people developed said very clearly that if you don't have vaccinations and you've got a vulnerable population, you're gonna have to keep them apart. And, you know, the economy is going to suffer, but you got to get rid of the disease first. And this group managed to coalesce around this one compelling woman whose name, great name is Charity Dean, who was at the time the deputy state public health director. She had been the county health public health director in Santa Barbara County. And she's just one of these courageous people that the story is told brilliantly through. But the culmination was her sitting down with Gavin Newsom and his people and explaining the science. And once he heard that, he took action. And once he took action, other people took action. So 
I might say, well, what what's Louisiana going to care about what California thinks, or what what is what is the uh, what do the Eastern California legislators care about what's going on in the coast? But somebody cares, and somebody care somebody who cares enough that can get the ear of the right person can do something, and. We have heard monstrous problems on this call and lots of no silver bullets, lots of different things that people are doing and a consensus that these are things that are important to be done. So maybe we need to have that kind of a group that, that influences the people that we can influence who then in turn can influence other people. So I, I wanna, I highly recommend the book, The Premonition by Michael Lewis, it's a great book. It's any other questions for Brenda and Monica? Dan? Not a question, but uh, to follow up on Neil's comment about local and also Brenda's and everybody else's about how local can spread beyond local. Two of the things that I think I'm most proud of that Berkeley has done in the last eight or 10 years are first of all, to legitimize something called a material recovery enterprise. We had to do that in order to move to the place where we now occupy land that was zoned wrong for us. And we had to actually rewrite the zoning law, which when I got together with the uh, person who was uh, the, the head, the, the point person for the planning department, she said, I know nothing about recycling. What I need is a bright line test between your kind of business and anybody else. <clears throat> and you have to actually write the thing so that it applies to all businesses like yours, not just yours. So it can't just be for you. So I said, fine. And we came up with this term, Material Recovery Enterprise, MRE. And I put it now at the bottom of every email I ever write, because I want everybody to know that that came from Berkeley and that it could spread all over and could revolutionize things because zoning really decides who, who gets to get on property and do what? So uh, that's what we did with that one. <clears throat> the other one happened just this last year, came from a completely unlikely source, but we had been lobbying them through the Zero Waste Commission for about two years. And what we said was, we're in the disposal business, just like you are. You're wasting disposal. We are conserving disposal. Wasting disposal is 100% financed by disposal <clears throat> service fees. We are disposing of things too, but we're doing it in a way better way. So what we need is a disposal service fee that would pay us for the, the service that we actually provide, which is superior to wasting. And, the, and finally, we had a big meeting with the uh, head of public works who is retiring and about four or five of his hot head people all the uh, all the the people that really crunch numbers and we pointed out what needed to be done and they came back with something that just blew my socks off they said okay we're going to start paying you a disposal service fee the amount of that fee is $47.74 a ton why 47.74 because it's the same fee that the city pays now when they take a load of trash to the Upland Landfill Altamont owned by Waste Management Incorporated. So they pay $47.74 to them, and now they're paying $47.74 to us for every ton of reusable or recyclable metals, some metals that we take off the transfer station floor. If that went everywhere, that would totally tilt the, the, the whole playing field in favor of recycling and opposed to wasting. And they're, they're saving a fortune because they don't have to transport anything. You do all the transport. That's right. We do the transport, uh, transporting and all that. And you could argue, and some of us do, that we ought to actually get a better disposal service fee. But what the hell? I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Can I add? And I think the symbolic importance and the irony of it is just beyond belief. Yeah, so let me let me add a little backstory to Dan's story about the zoning. Dan yeah. indeed did write a zoning ordinance that changed the zoning, and that was important, and it's still important. But what happened before then is is 
also illustrative, which is that there is a, a lowly district council member in the city of Berkeley that Urban R was in her district and Urban R was thinking about having to move out of the city. And she was approached and through her, her efforts, the city council passed a unanimous resolution, the likes of which I've never seen before or since. And it said simply that the city of Berkeley would do everything it possibly could to keep Urban R in Berkeley. And with that unanimous resolution in hand, all of a sudden it got a lot easier for Dan Knapp to approach the planning department and get their, you know, okay with him writing a zoning ordinance that they would then use. Took one city council person to do that. I wanna add another symbolic story and it comes from California uh, in the 70s. Um, I, people may not know it, I was trained in California in recycling, the early CRRA pioneers, uh, Rick Anthony, Hulls, Meyerson, Gary Peterson, et cetera. But um, the, the real, at the time, uh, before people like Dan Knapp and, uh, came on the scene uh, in California, um, uh, Cliff Humphrey was the uh, guru in the best sense of the term. Yeah. And he had a publication which inspired me. Uh, it, it was, he was a localist, he's still alive and, and kicking and doing good things. But he wrote an essay, or an essay was written by his staff in Modesto, Modesto Ecology Action, in the uh, early 70s. And uh, I'll send it to people. I'll, I have it and I'll send it to people. Um, and it was an essay on how you could move mountains at the local level. And the first thing he mentioned in my memory was zoning and controlling who can do what, where, and when. Uh, so I, I just want to say that... Uh, uh, this this is this argument is uh, uh, circular in the best sense of the word. The other thing I want to say is that uh, many people say that that movement in California in 69, 70 was the start of the modern recycling movement. And we have done a great job. We've done our job. Uh, you know, 50, 60,000 businesses, a million workers, billions of dollars in our sector. Um, uh, and in fact, if uh, recyclers rule the world, uh, we would have done much better. We had to fight incinerators and everything else. But um, that was an inspiring story to me that we can work, we can move mountains at the local level uh, through all, he named several other mechanisms. It's a, a really historic uh, essay and I'll send it out to people. So with, with that to segue, I wanna, I wanna move on in the show just a little bit. Doug, did you wanna add something? Yeah, for Monica, she showed a, you showed a map of the United States and they showed that all the waste of energy, well, most of them were in the, the uh, New England area. And I think it was a comment by either Dan or uh, maybe Natalie, I'm not sure, but a few months ago, that because the prevailing winds are blowing uh, from west to east, that it blows the uh, pollution out to the ocean. And uh, I think it was uh, someone mentioned about, you know, uh, dilutions. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm just wondering, uh, this comment about this 10% uh, uh, recycling credit for uh, waste of energy plants, that's absurd. Is that something that's being pushed back by, I mean, how, how can that exist? Yeah, it's part of the diversion credit regulations and from AB 939, historically still there. So I'm yeah. open to uh, a big edit. <laughs> just delete, yeah, and delete, delete. In Maryland, we just got rid of that. We just a law just got passed to remove incineration. It was it was the ash that was counted. So these incinerators in our state were, you know, recycling the ash into road aggregate, and so they could count that as recycling. We got rid of that, and um, but you know, states like it's not just New England or elsewhere. In, uh, Florida allows the incinerators to count towards the recycling levels. So yep. there's other states. It's a big issue. So I want to move along with the show. Uh, Neil had mentioned moving mountains. And that's something that engineers do. <laughs> and our, uh, our pioneer that we're, we're going to read from the archives tonight is Brenda Platt. And part of her, part of her reading is about engineering. And I, I've asked Bonnie to do the reading tonight, if she would be so kind to do it. I have no idea what's being picked. <laughs> That's right. It's all good, Brenda. Because <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have a five-minute limit on that interview. <laughs> well, this, this is an excerpt that Susan Kinsella provided, and oh, she, she provided a little connectivity narrative within it that Bonnie will read. Yes, <clears throat> it should be about <clears throat> six to seven minutes. 
Ooh. And can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So a little bit of context and then I'll jump to it. So Brenda is starting her 36th year with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. But when she was interviewed in 2007 for the Recycling Archives, she reminisced about her training as a mecha mechanical engineer. And she said, when I was a, in mechanical engineering school, my classmates would joke with me. They called me a flower engineer because I didn't wanna design the same stuff that they were designing. One time in mechanical engineering design class, we all got the same assignment from our teacher. He told us to design a machine that could close pamper boxes. The boxes came to the box closing machine on a moving conveyor. I remember going to Dr. Kaufman and saying, I am not in engineering school to design this kind of stuff. Can I please design something else? He said, well, what do you want to design? I answered, how about something like a bicycle bus, something useful? He said, okay. The design I turned in was for a bicycle bus that seated eight people. It was enclosed. As a passenger, you could pedal at whatever speed you could manage. It was geared so any effort would still contribute to the speed of the bus. That took care of the locomotion part. The bus still required a driver to take charge of braking and steering. The design project was quite fun for me. Even as a college student, I was very interested in exploring appropriate technology. In Brenda's work over the past three and a half decades, Brenda has continued that approach to finding solutions that enhance people's lives on several levels at once. She said further on in the interview, I think the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has quite a unique lens on this issue. We're not just for recycling everything, of course we are, but we're also for keeping the materials and the value within the local economy. We want the dollars and the resources to benefit local regions. Our vision of recycling is not waste management, picking up the recyclables in a single stream truck and hauling it 40 miles to their 1500 ton per day recycling facility. One of waste management's new facilities in Elk Ridge, Maryland is actually rated at 1500 tons per day. So this isn't made up, it's all too real. It's highly automated and cross contamination and out throws are big problems. They're shipping mixed plastics and paper to low wage countries all over the world for reprocessing, often by hand. Most of this recovered paper is going to China right now. Mind you, this was in 2007. Our position is the opposite of waste management's business model. We want to see those same recycling volumes that they are taking to landfills upgraded in the local communities and sold by local people. As much as possible, we want to see the materials made into high value products as near to where they are generated as possible. We want the bulk of recycling jobs to stay here close to the resources, close to where the resources are generated. We want to help local entrepreneurs willing to work on returning those refined products to the local community. This is what we mean by closing the recycling loop locally. I think finding out who is in control of the materials and how they are handling them is more interesting than figuring out who can label as waste collectors and waste disposal disposers. Communities should be in control. They should manage the system to benefit everyone. We like nonprofit mission-driven recycling, partly because they're not so concerned with bottom line profits. It's been well documented documented just how much money in general flees the community when franchises or chains are all that are left. ILSR has done a lot of work on this. The conglomerates, banks, and their financial advisors won't be locally based. They don't give back to the community in the same way that local businesses do because they're based in Texas or Chicago, and that's where the money goes. But meanwhile, the community isn't gaining. There are all kinds of documented ways of showing why 
you need independent, locally run, small scale businesses. The interviewer in 2007 asked Brenda, what system failures do you think are most important as examples to point to and say, we have to avoid these mistakes? She answered, when we were fighting the incinerators that had many local governments wanting, want, when we were fighting incinerators that so many local governments wanted, they discovered the most, that most stuff people just wanted to pick up the trash and take it someplace. These are the people who were in charge of sanitation or public works for cities. They were all used to collecting stuff and taking it to the landfill. They also fixed potholes, sweep the streets and maintained public infrastructure. But most had no experience marketing materials. Meanwhile, we were taking them about, we were talking to them about business development and economic development and recruiting and training salespeople. We were promoting making stuff and conserving stuff that you can sell locally. We didn't have, well, they didn't have any experience with that. What they wanted was a black box where they could take the community's garbage, put it in and be done with it. Fending off consumerism is our biggest task. Even though recycling rates have gone up in many areas, Disposal by wasting has gone up too. Recycling has to keep pace with population growth. Another challenge is that in the last 30 to 40 years, the types of packaging and the number of single use products that we have have gone up too. I think the biggest challenge for us is sustaining the planet we've inherited. I want a planet that's livable for my kids and their kids and even the seventh generation of kids really. We have to fend off consumerism. I don't think people have to sacrifice quality of life to do this. I like the idea of more fun, less stuff. More fun, less stuff. Keep up the chant. More fun, more less, fun, more less fun. stuff. Yeah. More fun, less stuff. And I think that was Tanya. Tanya in Berkeley had had buttons with that. You know. I just put in, we have a new campaign called Small Business Rising at the Institute. So I put the link in for that. It's a campaign to promote independent small uh, businesses rooted in community. Part of our fighting monopoly power. So check that out. And I'm going to kneel a little bit next month about that. Thank you, Bonnie, for that, you know, for that reading, bringing those, those vitality to those words spoken 14 years ago and still sound pretty darn good. That's um, true. For those of you that don't know, Bonnie Betts is NICRA's social media coordinator. If you have something that you think NICRA members ought to know about or, or circulate, send it to her so she can get the word out. Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> Neil? May I, I, I'll be very brief. I just want to say, uh, tell you how Brenda was hired 36 years ago. Um, she, Do you uh, have to? <laughs> oh, come on. This is a, this is a wonderful story. Um, she uh, she came. She was someone else's intern. Larry, our friend Larry. We had dinner at our favorite French restaurant adjacent to the institute on 18th Street. And for, in five minutes, she was very impressive, of course. Um, but then she happened to mention that she got her uh, tra training in engineering from Professor Ali. Um, what was his uh, name? Ali, Ali Chambel, who I. I worked with as a professor at GW years before, and he was a wonderful person, um, a great engineer, social justice engineer. And when I knew that she was his student, I offered her the job. And of course, it was the best decision I've, I've made in my whatever how many years. And I have many, uh, not many, but several profound stories to tell about her prescience in the in in uh, conferences. But not with, tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> but I will, I will, I will uh, make a contribution, John, in a future uh, thing, just five minutes on some uh, profound things that Brenda said and did. Well, I think, thank you, Neil. That's so sweet of you. It's been a pleasure <laughs> working and learning from you all these years. Um, I will just say that Neil is a master of like, paper napkins and writing plans down and he i i uh, wanted to go be a peace corps volunteer and work in emerging countries emerging economy countries that on appropriate technology it was called back then 
And uh, he said, no, 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 we got to change America. We got to change America's inner cities. We got to change, change stuff here. You got to work here. You convinced me. But there's so many, it's, it's an honor to be part of all of you other recycling pioneers, Dan and Neil and everybody else who was part of that project. And, and just coincidentally to be asked to speak on the night you read, Bonnie read a quote from me and that bicycle bus. Yeah, um, it's, been, it's been fun. I, when I was in Amsterdam, I saw bicycle buses. The people who were pedaling were all drinking beer and getting drunk. And um, and uh, I saw some other European country, there was a bicycle bus that was collecting elementary middle school kids on the way to school. Nice. It was so lovely. I mean, I so it they are there are bicycle buses where people pedal. Yeah. And uh, there's a driver. So that was kind of cool to see. But anyway, I'm gonna go because it's like 10 o'clock my time here. Yes. So good luck, everybody. It was so nice to see you all. Thank you, Brenda, for Thank joining. Thank you, Brenda. Bye.